I want to congratulate all of you folks on something. And what I want to congratulate you about is that you are here in church this morning. Because you see, outside there, outside of these marble walls, all you've been subject to for the last week or two has been bad news. Nobody knows more about the pain, sorrow, woes, and sinfulness of a human being than a pastor. He knows the score. And he knows there's a lot of bad in this world. But he also knows that in the long run, the good overbalances the bad. Now you take that street out there. That's called Fifth Avenue. That is one of the most famous thoroughfares in the world. It ranks with Unter den Linden, the Champs Elysees. It ranks with Michigan Avenue and Wilshire Boulevard and oh, the Ginza. That's one of the greatest streets in the world out there. But when this church was built, that was a mud road. It was dirt. There was no stone in it. There wasn't even a pebble in it. And carriages drawn by horses got mired down in the mud of Fifth Avenue out there. So then they built a church on this corner, and the building committee was criticized because the church was too far out of the city. The city ended at 14th Street. This was the country. There was a farmhouse right behind the church. And after a while, they paved the street. That was six years before a war called the Civil War that was going to tear the nation in two, cut it in twain. Talk about dark clouds. People coming into the church through that mud on a Sunday, having heard all the bad news outside, must have thought the nation is about to be destroyed. But the preacher stood up in this pulpit, this same identical pulpit, same boards down there, no doubt. I can hear them creak once in a while, I know. <laughs> and what did he say to the people? If God be for us, who can be against us? We'll survive all this. And then one day, Behind the dirge, they carried the body of a man past his church. On his way to Springfield, a man named Abraham Lincoln. And the people thought the nation was through. Then came the great panic of 1857. Then came the Spanish-American War. Then came World War I. Then came One World II. Then came the Korean War. Then came the Vietnamese War. Now we're here, and they're still saying, gloom. <laughs> I don't minimize it, but the Church of the Living God is still here and to tell you that we have what it takes to survive any difficulty. Now, I myself came here in the depression of the 30s. What we've got now is a Sunday school picnic compared with what that was. We lived it out. The Bible says, come now, acquaint yourself with me, and be at peace. Thereby, much good can come to you. Now, as I say, I do not minimize the difficulties, the pain, the suffering, but that is part of the way it is in human life. 
That's what the book says. In the world, at whatever date, 1980, they'll say the same thing. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. What a word. But we have the faith that overcomes the world. So therefore, you can, by being a believer, be enthusiastic. And why can you be enthusiastic? Because when you have this faith really built into you, grounded into you, then you can handle anything in this life. That's a big claim, but it can be substantiated. When the Foundation for Christian Living had its last reunion down in the Bahamas, I was walking along there one day and I saw a man coming along in a wheelchair. He had a great big smile on his face, and he had a badge on which says, Bob McGee, Springfield, Oregon. And he had a T-shirt on with a sign. These signs you see on T-shirts say something about the people who wear the T-shirt. Not a bad idea. It's a personality revelation. Bob McGee said, Nothing can happen to me today that we together can't handle. And I went up and shook him by the hand, and I said, Bob, where'd you buy that T-shirt? Like one for myself. (laughs) But you don't need to go around having it engraved on your shirt. Where you want it engraved is in your mind, right down deep in consciousness. That's the place to have it engraved. Nothing can happen to me today that we together can't handle. Now, that isn't to say it won't be tough. There will come times when it's very tough. But if you have a deep, substantial faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Almighty God and in the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Bible, then no matter what it is, you get the wisdom to handle it. Now, I've always had a great deal of respect for mothers. Mothers have something that nobody else possesses. Some of them have it more than others, but all of them have it in potential. And it is an intuitive wisdom or perception. More so than the masculine gender has. Hate to admit it, but that's the case. (laughs) And I'm sorry my wife is present to hear this admission (laughs) from the book. But it is, I think, true. I've seen all kinds of mothers, highly sophisticated mothers, and uneducated mothers, and they seem all to possess it. For example, I was in Chattanooga the other day speaking to the helpline convention, and I went to the airport to come back to New York, and I wanted to go off in the corner because it was Saturday, and I wanted to do some more work on the Sunday morning sermon. I wanted to get away from people but there was a woman kept looking at me, and I, I didn't look at her. <laughs> I avoided her glance, and I was busy on papers. <laughs> but that didn't deter her. She came over to me, she said, aren't you Dr. Peel? For a moment I was inclined to say no, that's my cousin. <laughs> 
But I said, yes, I am. Oh, she said, I don't want to bother you. Well, I said, I'm working hard on my sermon tomorrow. And if I carry on a conversation, I won't be able to preach. Then I'll lose my job and be thrown out and go on relief. <laughs> oh, she said, I'm sure it wouldn't be quite that bad. Well, I said, you can't ever tell. She said, I want to talk to you. And I thought to myself, that's what I'm afraid of. She was about 40, 45 years old, I guess. She sat down. She was one of the most enthusiastic human beings I've ever encountered in my life. I, and I didn't make conversation, which wasn't difficult. I said, how many children you got? She said, I got five boys and three girls. Well, I said, get busy and get the other two girls. <laughs> But she said, I've had a lot of trouble in my life, Dr. Peel, and I want to thank you because you have helped me raise my children. Well, I said, I'm glad for that. Oh, yes, yeah, she said, I read your books when I don't know what to do, and I get an idea. Now, she said, I'm here at this airport to meet one of my sons. He is 18. And he's going to school in Washington, D.C. And he's coming in here to get his bicycle to ride back to Washington, D.C. And I said to her, how, long, how far is that? Well, she said she didn't know. And I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But it must be three or 400 miles just offhand. She said, I want you to see him. Well... I said, is he coming in on the same plane I'm taking back? And she said, yes. And I said, I can't help but see him. She said, I'm going to stay here and introduce him to you. Now, she said, when this boy was born, he was born desperately sick. He had, I think she said, cystoic, cystic fibrosis. Now, I haven't talked to any doctor to look this up. But that's what she said she had. And it sounds pretty bad, doesn't it, offhand? And she said, I was very bitter. Why did I have to have an abnormal baby? I've been a good mother. I hadn't done anything wrong. Why did the Lord give me this kind of a baby? And they said he wouldn't live. If he did live, he'd be a vegetable and all this and that. But she said, you know, I got an idea. I read the Bible all the time, and I pray, and I got an idea. And the idea was, just take this baby from the hands of God as he is, and love him, and believe in him, and be enthusiastic about him. Well, she said, I'd never heard anybody tell me that. It was something I thought of myself. I said, I said the same thing in a couple of books. But she said, I never read it in any of your books. It was an insight she got. So she said, I just went and I picked him up and I said, Dear Lord, I accept him just as he is. And I believe in him and I love him now she said the plane's coming in here he comes she said and you should have seen a husky that came over there and grabbed his mother and hugged her and kissed her until she cried for mercy <laughs> I said to him son you got quite a mother there you know it Oh, he said, I don't think she's so hot. <laughs> and he hit her on the shoulder as, as you would your father. <laughs> and then I learned that the father had died. So maybe she was mother and father. She believed out of a deep, perceptive insight that if you just uh, work with the will of God, wonderful things will happen.
For example, I have here a, a letter from a, a lady in uh, Texas. She's a physician. Her husband is a physician. They practice as a team. Isn't that wonderful? Two doctors, a husband and a wife. Well, she says, though I've been a reader of yours since 1950, I've never had occasion to write you until now. I feel I should share with you a miracle, though I know you probably find these more often than I. I will simply tell you the story as it happened. My husband and I are both busy physicians, and we are in our early 50s. On February 15th, my husband arose to experience the sudden onset of a severe headache accompanied by nausea and vomiting. We assumed he had a simple gastroenteritis. However, his headaches remained incapacitating and severe for the next three weeks. He is not and never has been a hypochondriacal. Hypochondriac. That's what that means. I hope you get the idea. He was not a hypochondriac. After three weeks and many tests, including two brain scans at $500 a piece, you see, even doctors complain at these high prices. <laughs> After three weeks and many tests, including two brain scans at $500 a piece, no diagnosis was made. About this time, I noticed in your creative help for daily living that comes from Pauling, New York, that there would be a prayer session on April 4th, which was Good Friday. And I wrote to your people about my husband's difficulty, requesting that it be prayed about. Praise the Lord. Since that day, he has gotten progressively better. I'm happy to say, from our standpoint, he is cured now. And I'm certain it is a miracle. Being a physician and very scientific, I was certain an explanation would be found for his awful headaches and that it would have grave implications. He says now he wishes he knew what caused the headaches, but I've told him it does not matter, for God cures better than he or I, and he agrees with this completely. P.S. I want to add, my husband is co-founder of a well-known clinic of 42 physicians and surgeons. He has a very comprehensive and thorough workup. He not only had brain scans, but other tests, including hospitalization for his workups. No stone was left unturned scientifically. But prayer cured him. God healed. Now, I like that letter because it's down to earth, it's common sense, it's scientific, it's realistic. It went into every aspect of the situation. These weren't those kind of people who say that God doesn't heal and who try to give you an authoritative statement of wisdom without any knowledge of the greatness of God. These are people 
who believe in the illimitable power of Almighty God. So what is your problem? Well, you say, I'm not sick, but I'm worried about these present conditions. How am I going to get through all this if uh, the job becomes a problem? Well, you know, I met a man on the street the other day, and I had the most interesting encounter with him. He said, do you know everything? I said, thanks. He said, I've got to have more money. I said, so have I. <laughs> we need it at the church. I said, what, what do you mean you have to have more money? Well, he said, I've got an expensive wife. <laughs> Boy, does she cost money, he said. And he said, I've got expensive habits myself, which I was glad to see he admitted. Why well, always lay it on your wife? <laughs> and he said, I, I got a job, but they don't pay me enough. And he said, I've got the meanest boss He's very insensitive, and he doesn't realize my value. He doesn't realize anybody's value. He said, we're in a bad organization. I'm stuck with it, and I know in times like this you can't move around from one to another very fast. But he said, i, I got to have some more money. I said, well, I tell you, did you ever... How long you worked for this company? He said, 10 years. I said, did you ever give them a new idea? Did you ever come into the boss and say, look, I figured a way we can save some money? Did you ever come into the boss and say, look, I figure uh, that we, if we do this process uh, by a little bit different, that, 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 that we could handle this situation much more uh, efficiently? You ever do that? He said, no, that's not my job. I got a job, I do it, that's that. I go home at night, that's that. Oh, I said, don't you remember about John D. Rockefeller Sr.? I said, he once hired a man at $50,000 a year. And all this man had to do was to sit in a revolving chair, which they then called a swivel chair, and think up ideas. That's all he had to do. That was his job. And he said, uh, they say that a jealous man came to Mr. Rockefeller and said, how come you pay that man $50,000 a year for just sitting in a chair and swiveling around and looking out the window? And Rockefeller says, if you can think up as many new ideas as he does, I'll give you $50,000 a year and a swivel chair to swivel around in. Now, don't get the notion from this that everybody you see sitting in a swivel chair is worth $50,000 a year. Most of them are just engaged in freewheeling. <laughs> but I heard it said by a distinguished businessman the other day that there are all kinds of jobs in this country going begging for people who can think, who can come up with a... New idea. Now you say, what in the world has that got to do with the church? <laughs> Everything. This is the place to get your mind geared up to producing new and creative ideas. And in this place, you get insights. Like a parable I heard one time. There was a man who prayed, and he told the Lord that he wanted more money. And the Lord is very kind-hearted, and he heard his prayer. And he called all his angels, and he said, You see that fellow down in New York City? He, he needs more money. And he's praying, and he's got a lot of faith, and he's asking us for some money. Go get some money and hand it down to him. And the angels went away, and they came back, and he said, Lord, we've looked all through the vaults of heaven. We haven't got any money up here. All we've got, though, are some uh, wonderful ideas and some great insights. 
and some marvelous uh, new fresh thoughts. And the Lord said, well, he's still praying for money. Send him down all these creative ideas. So they poured them out on a man, and pretty soon he became one of the most creative, innovative men that was in that business. And after a while, a boss called him in, and he said, you know, Joe, you've come up with so many new ideas, I'm going to increase your wages. So he finally went home with more money. Though he didn't get the money from God, he got it from the boss because he gave the boss some ideas, you see? So believe and get enthusiastic for life is good no matter what they say outside. For if God be for us, who can be against you? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of the wisdom of Christianity comes those practical, workable insights by which we can beat back all the foreboding and gloom and live creatively and enthusiastically through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.